Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of the For Goodness Sake YouTube channel. I'm your host, Mas Fenteclu, and I know that if you're clicking on this video, you've seen what the title of it is, so you know what we're going to talk about, but I'm going to preserve talking about the actual topic for a little bit. Um, I have a couple things I want to get in order first, but I just want to say I'm very excited for what we're going to talk about today. I think that it's very um, important for where we are today as a society in terms of moving forward with different opinions, in terms of um, in consuming information, and, and just in terms of hearing people out, even if we don't ever necessarily agree with them. So I'm very excited for what we have to talk about. It's very controversial, but I think it's very important. Uh, I love to be in the center of that controversy, and I love to take a very different opinion than most people, and that's just kind of by natural uh, association. That's not because I just want to say something uh, stupid, which maybe the topic of our uh, conversation today might be a little bit different than me in that aspect. They might want to always say something crazy, but <laughs> I digress. Before we get into that, I want to just take some time to thank you guys for showing me so much love on my last video. It was just the intro video and you guys supported it so much. A lot of views, um, a lot of people liking it, a lot of people subscribing to the channel already, even though it's such a baby channel so, so far still. So I appreciate you all so much. This has been in the making for me for so, so long. And the fact that I just came about and you're still choosing to just support it right away, it warms my heart. Friends, family, everything in between. I thank you all so much. Second of all, um, I have a kind of a different way of going about the actual videos than the intro video. Uh, these videos are going to be longer. I'm going to have a couple other aspects to them that I'm going to kind of progressively introduce as we go on. But uh, I think you're going to like it. If you have the attention span for a three hour video, I'm going to have videos like that for you. If you have the attention span for a 40 minute video, I'm going to have videos for you. If you like one on one blogs, you know, type videos, we're going to have that. And if you'd like interviews with my friends or different people that I've managed to get on, we're going to have that too. So if you don't like something on the video, please check out the next one because we'll probably have a completely different video out for you that you'll enjoy. So give me a chance, please. And of course, the very typical YouTube beg for you to like, subscribe, comment, all of the above on on this video, the past video, and all the subsequent videos to come. Shameless plug. This is how I, you know, have to try and build my brand. So please show me some love. Um, I would I would greatly appreciate it. So, uh, with that being said, I'm done with that. Moving toward the topic, uh, we'll start today's. Um, episode off with a segment that I'm going to call quote of the episode. And this episode's quote is uh, very, very applicable. Aristotle once said, there can never be genius without a mixture of crazy. And I think that today as I'm going to talk to you about my feelings about Kanye West and his support for Donald Trump, that's going to be very applicable. Um, to start it out, many people know Kanye West as the guy that kind of shook up rap. He really changed the way rap music was made. He, as a producer, he chopped up beats from old soul music and, you know, gave him a totally different flow, you know, gave him a totally different feel and created hip hop in that way rather than having just old soul music, R&B. He kind of blended these two things and made it what we think of hip hop as today. Um, moving on towards his career, he just continued to change the game, finding new ways to add elements to hip hop that we never thought we'd see before. Whether it was with um, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy or um, 808s and Heartbreaks, or, and again, I could really say any of his albums, but. Yeezy, Yeezus, uh, The Life of Pablo, 
I mean, all of his music has been really formative and, and transformative, too, uh, throughout his career. So that's where we kind of get the genius part, as well as the fact that he's an, an incredible fashion mogul. Whether it was when he was running out wearing skinny jeans and everybody was like, dude, that's weird. Why are you wearing like leather skinny jeans, leather pants and skinny jeans and all this stuff? Like that's so weird for a dude, especially a black dude. He didn't care. He started, you know, movements. Shout out all the people that did that too, you know, like Lil Wayne skater, you know, outfits and everything was, was similar too. So I'm not going to say he's the only person, but... I do need to give him credit for changing the fashion industry, whether it's over in um, across seas in Europe or it's uh, right here in the U.S. with his Adidas shoes, the Yeezys. Um, you know, he's incredible in what he's done, and he's been in the shoe industry long before that as well with Nike, doing other things. So um, he's an incredible, incredible artist. Always has been, and I think he always will be in the next things that he's preparing to do with his life. But recently, obviously, he's uh, professed support for our president, Donald Trump. And it's kind of upsetting for a lot of people because of who we thought he was in a lot of his music. But, um, he's talked about issues that were very close to um, black families. Um you know, in the past, in um, I think on late registration, you know, he was talking about, uh, I think All Falls Down is on late registration. He was talking about how we how we have this consumerist culture that makes us, you know, we do this, we do that, we have to buy chains, we have to work our asses off just to, you know, get some money so we can look good and like, you know, look fresh. And just so that, you know, uh, <laughs> the white man gets paid off all that, you know, so he talks about things like that, and then all the way up to uh, Yeezus, you know, he's talking about, and this is in 2013, and I don't know many people that were talking about this in 2013, but he's talking about private prisons profiting off of the backs of people that are in prison, majority black and Hispanic people, you know, he's talking about how the DEA and the C CCA has teamed up to lock brothers up, you know, um, this is a dude that has, he, he went on live television for a Hurricane Katrina relief, you know, fundraiser with all these celebrities, and he said on live television, George Bush does not care about black people in 2006. This is like, he called George Bush out for being a racist on live TV in 2006, and, and they stopped. Everybody like dropped dead in their tracks, and they're like, um, we gotta go to break, uh... <laughs> The man got on uh, Good Morning America after that. I think it was Good Morning America. It might have been like the CBS version of that, but whatever. The man got on, on that news outlet and sat down with, with George Bush. And George Bush said, oh, come on, man. Like, you know, help me out. You know I don't, I'm not racist, da 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 And he was like, can you apologize for saying that? And, and Kanye West was like, mm, no, I don't say things that I don't believe. You know, I'm not going to say something that I don't, you know, actually believe. So, no. <laughs> I mean, the man called George Bush himself out for being racist. So how do we get from from that level of, you know, woke, you know, he's woke to our issues to all of a sudden now he's, you know, he's crazy. He's too rich. He's, you know, he's too rich. He's out of touch. He doesn't know what is going on. You know, he's uh, he, he's pandering to to him because he's to Donald Trump because he's rich. I, I mean, I've seen all these things. Um in addition to things like he's just he is and always has been a piece of shit he's cocky he's arrogant he doesn't care about all these things which are more uh attacks on his character that are separate from just his support of trump which i i want to get into a little bit as well but I'll, I'll do that in a moment um but i think that that's like where we're at right now in terms of the public opinion of kanye west uh people are just shocked right now and they're very hurt that he's supporting him and and I understand it and I want to take a moment to say that I completely understand it it doesn't seem to make any sense on the surface level when when he first went to um when he first went to uh, uh Trump's uh first I, the two things that happened first he went to 
meet with him before the campaign, I believe, in in 2016. And then in 2018, he went with the hat to uh, Trump's office. And, uh, and that second one, after he had gotten out of uh, the rehab facility in Wyoming, that second one was what really had sparked a lot of people's outrage. When he had done that, I was one of the people that were like, very taken back and i was thinking dude this dude is just out of touch you know that's that's exactly where i was at i was like this dude doesn't know what's going on he doesn't care about our our real issues on the ground you know you know he doesn't care about black people's issues he doesn't care about what you know trump's doing with uh latino issues you know in terms of what's going on in these migrant camps concentration camps let me add in terms of these migrant concentrate concentration camps that are being held and funded and run by ICE and Donald Trump with a lot of GOP people in Congress that are playing advocate to it and they're at the very least complacent with it. So I was like, no way, he just doesn't care about these things. He's just he's just out of touch. And for a long time I felt that, and and I think it was until I I listened to his Charlemagne the God interview that I was like, okay, so you're not crazy. I was thinking like, you're you're making sense, you know, at some level. Like I understand he was he had just got out of rehab and he was just um, he had admitted in his music about taking a lot of drugs after that period, and so I could tell by watching the interview that he'd just come out of taking some drugs and he wasn't completely socially um, aware of what he needs to be saying and what he needs to, like, the different uh, mannerisms that he was supposed to have to to create a, a better, you know, more okay look for a person. Which, again, before this, uh, Kanye West has never been the type of person to care about what he needs to say or do to make people think that he's normal. Because obviously he's not normal, and obviously nobody is normal, but there's people that are so far from the norm that they make even abnormal people (laughs) think that they're not normal. So, he's definitely one of those far from the norm people. I watched that video, and I saw that he definitely wasn't um, aware of certain things in terms of how he needed to appear, but I saw that his answers were not based in hate they weren't based in ignorance of what Donald Trump is doing to a certain extent I'll I'll add to a certain extent some things that Donald Trump is doing he doesn't realize are not good in the TMZ interview he he spoke on Donald Trump trying to do things with businesses or whatever making making taxes and he said something about what he was doing was for small businesses. And he doesn't realize that that's really not true at all. He's not helping any small businesses at all. He's not helping any farmers. He's hurting them both. And that's ignorance. But to be fair, I don't know many people... Um, I don't know how many people are politically aware to know the the tax code that uh, Trump sent out and who it affects most and you know what it does. Like... I'm sure there's many people that hear that he had done that and that it hurts everybody but a, a, a very top per- echelon of people. But I don't know how many people are really a, politically aware enough to know that. So I just would like to say that some of the criticism people get is y- you need to keep it consistent because, you know, um, if, if other presidents pass out tax codes all the time and nobody pays attention to them. Um, and rightfully so because they're one of the most complicated issues, maybe... Um, Immigration is probably the only one that's higher than it, but it's complicated to understand, but don't only harp on this man for not knowing about what's going on with taxes, um, even though he rightfully so does not know. However, in other in terms of uh, some other, uh, other aspects of his support, it is not um, an ignorant level of support. Um, he talked about it on the second TMZ interview that he had. Um, he talked about responding with love. 
and believing that um, people can change. And he said that everybody else is kind of at, uh, going at Trump in a certain way. And he believes that he can respond in his way with love so that it has a, a different effect. Because he said that nobody is going to learn to be better if you're sitting there telling them, hey, you're not being good. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. He believes that if he responds with, hey, I love you, I don't agree with you on this, I don't agree with you on that, but I want to see you do better, I want to see you do this, this is what I want you to do, then he believes he can create some change. Now on that note, Kanye West went to the White House after all the um, kind of frenzy about him. He went to the White House with Kim Kardashian, and they both were talking to Donald Trump, and really, Kanye West was talking at Donald Trump, and I don't know how many people talk at Donald Trump, but he was one of them, and he was telling him about the things that he wanted him to do in terms of criminal justice reform, um, helping Chicago with a lot of the problems that they're going through, and in terms of uh, freeing people, Kim Kardashian was also in this aspect, freeing people that were wrongly, wrongfully convicted of crimes. And so they got the um, uh, wrongful convictions um, overturned and they got um, some semblance of criminal justice reform passed. And I'm not ignorant enough to say that that's um, only because of Kanye West and I'm not ignorant enough to say that that's because of D Donald Trump's change in heart. I understand that that's an issue that's very hot button right now. A lot of money has left um, the criminal justice, uh, the uh, CCA which is the private, the private prisons corporation that uh, profited a lot off of um, the backs of having uh, prisons and pr people in them to, to fund corporations and other things. A lot of money has left that and gone into the migrant concentration camps facilities that are still being funded right now by Trump and his, uh, his administration. So I'm not ignorant of to say that's because a or B correlation, but I'm 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 just ad adhering to the fact that he is doing something that he believes is helpful, and in some semblance of a, a result, it it is helpful, and um, and there's a there's a lot to be said about um, negative backlash. You know how how does how does the backlash that people feel when he wears that hat or or says or does other things that say stand in support of Donald Trump how does that create a negative affect on the rest of the world and I think that that's a, a fair point and I I think that it's it's understandable if there is that and it ends up hurting the world in a certain aspect because of that um, and I would say that if you listen to Donald uh, I'm sorry if you listen to Kanye West himself he understands that, and he apologizes for that, right? In the first Donald... Uh, fuck, I don't know why I keep saying Donald Trump. In the first TMZ interview, Kanye gets everybody going by saying slavery is a choice, which I'll get to in a moment. He says slavery is a choice, and um, people go crazy, and um, one specific reporter there I wish I remembered his name, um, but he's he kind of fires back at Kanye and just, you know, because Kanye asks everybody, am I free thinking right now? Do y'all feel me? Blah, 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 blah. And, and some people say yes, and this other dude's like, uh, no, I don't. I don't. I grew up on your music. I always defended you. Everybody used to talk shit about you in this room, but I would uh, I would be the one person having your back, and now I'm, I'm embarrassed by that because you're all talking about this historical stuff that's inaccurate. It's not true, you know, you know, blah, 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 and it hurts me, and it embarrasses me, and I feel bad for you, blah, blah, blah. He roasts the shit out of Kanye, to be honest with you, and in a lot of ways, he was he was right, you know, the things he was saying was like about the historical inaccuracies of the numbers of slaves and just the, um, you know, what institutional racism is and, and just things like that, and I understand everything he was saying, and it, it is factually true as well. Um, so he had great points. Kanye West came over to him. 
he apologized to him. He had he gave him a hug. He was like, "Look, man, um, I understand what it makes you feel to wear that hat. That when I wear that hat, I'm sorry. I didn't know people were gonna feel this type of way about it. I really didn't. I'm sorry about that. Um, you know, I'm sorry I made you feel this way. You know, by by my comments, I didn't mean to make you feel that way. You know, but he's like, but this is where I'm trying to. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to be this type of person where I'm trying to." be open i'm trying to be loving because there's a certain type of way that we've been that hasn't worked and on that point i'd like to redirect us back to what i said about what kanye did in 2006 to president bush he said george bush doesn't care about black people on live tv he called the president who was not even as openly racist as this president racist on live tv in front of everybody. He's been there before where he has called out racism when he sees it. So to think that he doesn't recognize this as racism, our president right now is racist. I think it's incredibly ignorant for us to believe that about him. I think it's incredibly ignorant for us to think that he can't see what this is for what it is. Now, if we see that he believes that. Or if we, I'm sorry, let me flip that. If we believe that he sees that and we're still upset that he doesn't call it out. If we're upset that he stands by him in certain aspects anyway, even if we can understand that it's for a purpose that he believes is good. We don't have to believe it's good. We don't have to believe that he's trying to get people to love each other. We don't have to believe that he's trying to get people to come together. We don't have to believe that, but we have to hear what he's saying. In that he believes that he's doing that. So if we believe that he sees that Donald Trump is a racist. And we believe that he sees that he's trying to make it better by loving him. Then maybe. Maybe we can just agree to disagree on the methods that we're going about healing racism. We can just agree that we think right over here. I don't want to associate with you if you're racist. I don't want to associate you with you if you if you're partic- participating in in things that are horrible to a great deal of people. Not even in terms of like uh, uh, economic policy or or like education, um, which are both areas that Trump's administration has been horrible to the American people and to. Um, specifically underprivileged people in general and that goes underprivileged in many different ways it's not just talking about race it's not even just talking about class that's talking about ableism that his his administration particularly Betsy DeVos has um, participated in uh, cutting funding from um, special needs schools and um, athletic um, organizations for people with special needs it's it's ableism and it's embarrassing. It's like the most underprivileged group that there is, and you're just gonna um, spit in their face. It's terrible. Um, so that's not where we want to even worry about right now because of the fact that there's humanitarian crisis crises going on at the border. So at the very least, that's going on. If you don't even want to talk about those other policies, a humanitarian crisis, a, a, a concentration camp horde is is across our border right now um, for people that are running from situations in their homeland that America is complicit in creating and we're separating them and we are putting them in conditions that we wouldn't put terrorists in. It's better in Guantanamo Bay than it is in, on these borders. It's horrible what we're doing right now. As a country, we will be ashamed in, in 10 years, hopefully, if we're lucky that we look back on it that soon, um, with, with disgust in ourselves and, and, what, and what happened and, and who we elected. That being said, he chooses to go about it a different way. He chooses to go about it in a way that he loves 
everybody, right? And that would be the goal if you um, are trying to get to Utopia is have everybody love everybody. And he's choosing to be the example for everybody to see that he loves the person who everybody hates the most. Even if it's hate that is rightfully so. Hate isn't necessarily a good thing no matter who it's towards. So I would like to take a moment to talk about um, something that maybe a lot of people in um, interracial families can understand. Um, So I'm the son of an Ethiopian immigrant and my mom is white. She's French and German and... Um, our white side of the family has been here for a long time, you know, so when, when my mother and father were getting together, somebody very close to my mother and who ended up being very close to me, she ended up loving me and I loved her as a second mother. She advised my mother not to have kids with my father because she believed that children in mixed relationships, interracial relationships end up suffering. They end up suffering because they're not accepted by white people and they're not accepted by black people and it's just better to not have it happen at all. This is somebody who I loved until her passing with all of my heart and soul and who loved me with all of her heart and soul. Furthermore, that's a good example um, because she ended up being my second mother, you know, and I spent so much time with her and at her house. There's family members that I have that have absolutely no understanding of their own racism. I have a I have a family member who calls black kinky hair, even go so far as to call it nappy. She calls nappy hair nigger naps. That's a cousin of mine. That's a close cousin of mine and that's what her her statement is. You know if you jerry rig something you jerry rig something you know like you have to make something makeshift into you know something you know let me get some duct tape on it or let me try and figure out how i can make it work it's a little bit broken right now you jerry rig it i have i have a cousin that that calls that nigger rigging it these are family you know these are family right here and and that's what i personally yes but many people across the country have to deal with and that's that goes for a lot of different situations, you know, sexism, you know. I've heard terrible jokes from my my cousins and and uncles and and you know just things like that. Um, and I'm and I'm a hundred percent positive. Ninety nine percent of the women in this country would say that that are aware of sexism and that understand that it's a issue and a systemic issue. They would say that it is. Um, very rampant in their family. Um, this is this is something that a, a lot of people have to deal with. Is that the people we love most are not always the most consciously um, aware and of others, and they're not always the most empathetic. Now, remember, this is what this whole podcast is about: is trying to become more conscious and trying to become more empathetic of others. And so, in that light, you know, I'd like to say. I understand that what Trump is doing right now is horrible, but man, saying fuck you does not help it. And that's coming from somebody who said fuck you to Trump many times. I'm just saying, bottom line, it doesn't help. I'm not saying that sometimes he don't make me mad enough to say fuck you. I understand where everybody comes from in that aspect. I understand when you see people looking like you in families just being ripped apart, you know, and you see, you know, somebody who stands for you, like Colin Kaepernick, taking a knee for you, for the, for the injustices that you and many others that look like you have faced, and just have to eat it and deal with it. And that man goes on live, tweeting about how the fact that that man Kaepernick is a son of a bitch, and all these people, players that do should be fired. I understand how that makes you feel. Because I was right there on Twitter tweeting, you know, fuck this man, and, you know, he don't even know it's systemic racism and blah, 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 and getting in fights with all, excuse me, getting in fights with all type of people on um, on the internet about it and what the protest is about and all types of things. So, 
I'm not here to judge anybody that feels any type of way towards Trump or his administration or anybody that supports him. I'm not here to judge you. I'm just here to say that when somebody else comes up like Kanye West and talks about how us saying fuck you to him and them isn't healing the world, I'm going to say he's right. I'm going to say he's a better person than me in the sense that he can say that. In the sense that he's not... Just getting consumed with his hatred. Because I believe he sees what's going wrong and he's trying to do it in a different way. He's trying to be the solution in a different way. He's trying to be the healing in a different way. I'm trying to get to the point where I can look at Trump and I can say, You're sick, man. You need healing. I can't give him that healing. You know, I don't know who can, but. He needs healing from his heart because that's not, you don't go around do things like that because you just are a bad person. There's no such thing as a bad person in this world. It's people that are hurting. It's people that have had their hearts hardened. That's what we need to heal from. We need to heal each other by, by, by loving each other. And, and sometimes love needs to be hard. Sometimes love needs to be like, you have fucked up. You need to see that this, this, that is wrong. This, this, that is hurtful. And now you need to go and you need to clean up your mess. You know, my mom loves me very much, but sometimes, you know, I would, I would hurt somebody and she would come home and just, you know, she would rail into me on why I was hurting somebody else. You know, I get my punishment, you know, I have to do these chores and stuff like that. And then afterwards, she'd come up to me and tell me too, you know, I love you. But right now, I'm very, very mad at you. I'm very disappointed in you. And she would have the emotional awareness to explain to me the dichotomy of her feelings. Of She loves me so much, but she's extremely angry with me for how I'm behaving. Emotions are complicated. And so you can have love for human beings and still be very, very, very angry with what they're doing to other people. I'm not telling you to sacrifice that anger. I'm just trying to tell you, remember that you can still have love. A criticism of, of the left nowadays is the fact that identity politics has, has pushed us to not be able to have different opinions in, the, in a constructive way. And to some extent, I agree with that. Some extent, I believe that that's just uh, um, that some people on the on the right are just not trying to understand others, and in not trying to understand others, they say, "Well, you just don't want to understand me." And this is this is a very valid thing to think about the right too, in in some ways. In other ways, it takes patience, and it takes the empathy of somebody. Seeing that somebody else wants to learn, to be able to explain them your problems, explain them your issues with what they have to say. Not just getting mad and giving up on them, saying, oh, well, they're racist, they're sexist, they're homophobic, they're transphobic, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, they're ableist. I understand that all those things might be true, but if we want to change the world, we have to sit down with those people and we have to tell them, Without a label, without the racism, sexism, X, Y, Z. Without that, we have to tell them, you are thinking about it in this way. From what I hear, from what you just said, you know, you just told me this, and this is what I take from that. And I believe that that's wrong because this, this, and that. What do you think about that? And let them think I'm on it. And then they can say, Oh, well, no, that's not what I'm thinking. Well, maybe it is what I'm thinking, but this is why it's okay that I think that. And you say, well, this is why it's not okay that you think that. Because there's people, X, Y, Z. And they come back at you, you know, an A, B, C. And it's not pretty, you know. It's You don't get to snap on somebody on Twitter. And then it's, you know, like, you're right. And that's it, you know. It's unfortunately not about that. It, I wish it was. <laughs> that would make it so much easier. One of my favorite teachers and closest teachers to this day, shout out Chris Weinferner, she had an amazing saying. She would always tell me, well, Mesfin, 
Do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? We have that choice. We are probably right in we're talking about racism, uh, homophobia, sexism, transphobia, and anything else that's in our personal lived experience in terms of oppression and aggression towards ourselves and our and our identities. How can you be wrong? However, you have to understand that nobody else gets to live your experience. Nobody else has seen the things you've seen. Nobody else has walked in, in your shoes, you know? I am 100% sure that if, if any racist person would walk one day in my shoes, or I'll just give them a week just to make sure we cover all the bases, they would be like, oh my god, I'm so sorry, like, you, you're right, like, this is not right, this is fucked up, like, this, it's just different, like, this is so different from me, right, like, this is, this is crazy. However, we don't get to do that. We have to do it the hard way. We have to listen to each other. And we have to speak to each other. Even when we don't want to. Tribalism is running rampant right now. And it's not just from the people that are in the MAGA camp thinking that, you know... <sighs> immigrants are coming to take their jobs. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't, I don't really know. I'm not, you know... I'm not the spokesman for them, so I'm not going to try to. But it's not just people that are racist that are being tribalist. There is a percentage of people who want to heal that do not heal others in the correct way because they had themselves have not been healed. I explained to my friend Roy... Um, when he was getting a little bit too anti-white person that well dude honestly like you're just putting all those people in a category and he's like oh no but it's like it's honestly like they're doing this and then and it's like okay i understand that they are the oppressor they are the hegemonic group like we can get into the the political science terms of it you know even though that's not what he was about, but we'll just, you know, for now, we'll just say it because it's, it's definitely an issue when, when we have all the educational terms that we can categorize people into. You know, I understand that there, are, there is a hegemony and people are the oppressors right now. But the oppressor will not change except one by one. We can't lump everybody in one group and just say, you're all this. You know, or you as a racist person are all a part of the racist people. And that's, that's all, you know, there's no changing. There's no learning. There's no, there's no growing. We will fail in our, in our movement. I use the, the term movement a lot on Twitter because I believe that there is a, a unified movement going on right now. It is, it is a movement towards consciousness and it's a movement towards empathy and it's a movement towards love. And of course it encapsulates the, a movement towards the end of racism, the end of sexism, the end of ableism, the end of homophobia, the end of transphobia, and the end of any other oppressive thing going on, classism, you know, all these things. We are in a unified movement. We don't need to separate down these things. It is a movement. It is the one and only movement. And we won't be successful in that movement if we cannot bring the oppressor onto our side, one by one. The more oppression that is removed by every single individual, the more the movement grows. We cannot be separated into all these different things. We must be a unified fist. You know, it's a, it's a saying I learned from my coaches in sports of how the, the fingers are so much, so much weaker than the fist. And that's what we must become, a fist. And that fist inclu includes those that are becoming aware of their own racism and their own issues. I'll take this time to, to explain a story um, about, my own, about my own biases that, I, that I'm learning to um, actively and, um, and aggressively confront. And how I believe that that has helped the movement. So... A little earlier in this year, um, I was learning about the formation of um, 
about terms such as queer and um, what it takes to identify as queer and an older definition than the modern definition today, the postmodern definition that was created for the term, the very original, you know, it's, it's kind of outdated now. It was, um, it involved having laws being um, created to separate um, certain sexual uh, mixings, um, it involved um, violent crimes being committed to enforce that, um, that law that was in, enacted. And, uh, and it involved like a social stigma around it as well. And I remember my own experience of being a black person in a predominantly white high school and just knowing how really how white women looked at me and looked at my black friends and um, speaking in any of my, uh, there was Hispanic males that I was friends with and they shared the same experience. And, you know, it's just, it wasn't a positive experience in short. There was a social stigma around being a black person. Um, and in many places there still is. You know, I've had people tell me that I was the perfect I was the perfect boyfriend because I was light skin and that like that itself is while it's not an inherently uh, negative thing you know it's not like inherent it's not like they're all like oh well I won't date you because you're light skin which is more towards the point of what I'm trying to get at it still is something where why is my skin a a reason why why you are tr attracted to me or, or in in, in the sense of why is my skin a quality about me? You know, it, it shouldn't matter. You know, my skin is not anything to do with me. There's millions of light skins out there. So that's like, you're, you're not making me feel any special anyways. And, and, and let me just back up and just say, even if there is um, any way to defend this, in my own personal experience, I don't feel special when somebody tells me that they like me because I'm light skin because it does not make me feel unique and it does not make me feel valued. There's many light skins out there. We are all very different, very unique from each other. That's not a it's not a personality trait to me. I want to be valued for my personality and what I bring to the table as a as a human being, not for the color of my skin. I don't want to be devalued from it either, <laughs> but I don't want to be valued for it. Um, but basically that's, that's why I felt like at my school was I was devalued for it or I was valued for it. I, either I was ostracized or I was fetishized just because of, you know, what I looked like in terms of skin and I wasn't valued for my appearance or, um, which is a thing that people can value in a relationship. I understand if you find me attractive, act on it. People that found me attractive would only find me attractive when they were under the influence or when there was nobody around. Um, and I was just never somebody that people could um, openly embrace as a, uh, as, a, as a possible prospect, you know, for a, a relationship. Now, granted, I am not complaining because it led me to where I am today. I am in love with a beautiful girl and I have no complaints about my, my road. I'm explaining this to, to say that because of that, I was, I was thinking that I was just this ahead of the game thinker and saying that, um, uh, inter interracial relationships is a queer um, identity. It could be classified as a queer um, uh, relationship because of the way that people look down on you, because of the way that parents even think about you know you know coming over to people's houses and having them say things to me like that. Like, it, it, I, I I try to mix my personal experiences with the experiences of others and the experiences of de definitions that were outdated. Granted, I didn't know it was outdated and I did, in fact, um, uh, speak to a professor of uh, ethnic studies who was also a queer woman who um, told me that I was, I was, she was like, wow, that's a, yeah, I, I, I think that you could be right. There's these laws that were in place about it and, you know, X, Y, Z. Yeah, I think you could be right. Messing like that's not a problem. So when I'm when I when I was saying that, I wasn't trying to um, rouse anybody, um, especially on the left. Like nobody on the left that I think would have a problem with it. Um, it was the people on the right, or at least even on in the center that were from back home, 
in my home state right now where I'm at in Minnesota that I was trying to get a reaction from, trying to get them to see what they were doing to people in our home state. Um, it was my, they were my target, you know, people who had their own racisms um, built into them and didn't realize what they were doing to people, that they were making them uh, an ostracized group of people. I had a good friend of mine, um, and shout out Isabel, um, she is queer and she also told me how ignorant I was sounding. And again, my point wasn't to get the reaction from a, a people from the left. And this kind of puts the, um, puts the Kanye thing back into, um, what's important is sometimes we, we comment on things that aren't necessarily hurting us. And this is what people do with Kanye and they, they take what his thing is hurting um, their, their own um, identities and they don't want to see where it might be beneficial. And now my situation is a little bit different and so I don't want to equate them in the same thing. I want to bring that up be to show that she showed me where I was ignorant and I grew from that. You know, I, it, I took more of a, um, of a uh, time to take a holistic look at what is what is the definition of queer and what is the um, the struggles that they have gone through that that I I have not been aware of previously to this point you know and I, and by her calling me out in a way that is loving as well in a way that is like I don't fuck with what you're saying I still fuck with you but I don't fuck with what you're saying I'm gonna call it out and I'm gonna say this is exactly why it's wrong not you are wrong, you are canceled, you are crazy, you know? But this is wrong, and this is ignorant. This is why it's wrong. She allowed me to grow. I have now been a better advocate for people of LGBTQ rights because of her calling that out. I can advocate for people who fall under the LGBTQIA spectrum and advocating for their rights because she called my ignorance out with love. And she didn't just ostracize me. And she didn't just block me right on the spot. Which she could have done too. And this is, this is what people are doing with Kanye. They're, they're canceling him. And I understand, I'm not trying to tell you that you can't do anything. You can do whatever you want. But just understand that you're missing out on an opportunity to educate somebody when you, when you cancel them. You're missing out on an opportunity to bring somebody to your side when you ignore them and ostracize them. That's essentially my Kanye issue. Is um, He is ignored and canceled instead of being loved. And I think that's the issue with what's going on today in society. We are completely canceling people that we need to be reaching the most and we need to be healing the most. My second issue is that people don't look into what he has said. You know, people don't watch full interviews. And this is the thing with everybody. We're a headline society. I've been guilty of it too. I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just saying this is something that's prevalent. We don't look into what people say. We don't research what they're saying, you know, the backstory, the context, everything. You know, I understand what, what Kanye said about slavery as a choice is historically inaccurate. You know, I could go give you the, the history of, of revolutions that have happened. I could give you the history of how in the South, you know, there were slaves that had to be kept a certain level of, of happy because if not, their babies would end up floating in a river somewhere and, you know, or their, you know, Family would have like glass in their grits and stuff, you know. Um, you know, Killer Mike was talking about it on the uh, Jamel Hill Unbothered podcast. Um, shout out to them. Uh, but that's not the point of what he was saying. Yes, what he was saying was historically inaccurate. What he was talking about is a is a legacy and a history of psychological slavery that we are still in today. Consumerist culture that he's talked about for years that we're still in today you know the hamster wheel of society needing to uh, uh have more 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 
get higher, get higher, get better, you know? That's, that's what he was talking about. That we can't find a way to be happy with ourselves, to love ourselves, to feel that we are enough to achieve our goals, to go after our goals, to not listen to what other people say when they tell us we're not good enough at our goals or to get our goals. Psychological slavery is a real thing and it's still prevalent today. And yes, what he said might have been historically inaccurate. But the, the underlying point of what he was saying is consistently true throughout history. We are ignoring the nuance of what people say. You know, just because the overarching you know, look of it is, is incorrect. And that goes for every single person, you know, news, you know, articles that we see on Twitter, you know. This is a constant problem and we need to start listening to people more. We need to start digging deep and trying to understand what people say. We have this voice in our head that says, like, oh, that's wrong. Or, hey, no, why did they say that? Or oh, that can't be true or whatever it is. Well, I can't believe that, you know, they said that I, I, I have to get mad about it. Instead, we could just be trying to hear them. You know, where is the truth in what you're saying? Okay, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. But okay, I find I find that common ground, you know. Now we can have a discussion. We can build from here. There's common ground everywhere and we're ignoring it just because there's all these other areas that we don't agree with. It's like we're all standing on two sides of, of chasms from each other and you know, there's all this area that we could fall off and just drop and not have, you know, not walk to each other. But then there's this like one bridge that's like obviously there and we could just walk to each other and, and be together. But we're like, nah, I, I can't ever do that. Like that, there's all that space over here. You know, I can never, I can, I, well, you want me to just jump across the chasm? Like that's impossible. Like it's easier than we think. Find the bridge, man. Find the bridge. That's it. I'd like to end this with um, really the main problem. I spent this whole um, almost of an hour uh, uh, episode speaking and kind of explaining Kanye's perspectives from my perspective and, and um, kind of defending why I think it's important to listen to people like him and, um, and also understand him. This is really the point that is my kind of trump card in the sense of where my problem is with um, people hating on Kanye West. And it's it's because I took, I took this earlier part because I wanted to get my opinion out there because it's fair for anybody to disagree with anything that I've said to this up in this point. Um, I think it's understandable. You are your own person. Do you. That's all, it's all this has been about. This is what Kanye was about. Free thinking, right? You know, be free, you know. This part is really a different issue that I don't believe people give enough attention to when it comes to um, the, the fighting with Kanye West and the disagreeing and the hating on him and the cancel culture around him. And that's the mental health aspect. This man has openly admitted to suffering from bipolar, manic bipolar disorder. And, and it's clearly... Um, so he's been medicated for it. He's um, he's openly been hospitalized for it, and yet we have this this need to call him crazy and to call him ignorant. All these things, and um, and this is not something that you know I've I'm just making up. Like you know I I was on Twitter the other day and they were just like Kanye always has been and always will be a piece of shit. And it's like, this is the language that we're using to a person that is serious mental illness, you know? Like, he's living with that. He's openly talking about it. He's, he made an album dedicated toward it and, and dedicating towards what he has going on in his mind and seeing if people can understand him. And it's a, an amazing piece of art and it's an amazing explanation of the feelings of mania. And I, and I don't understand how in this era where we're trying to push understanding mental health in a better way and get rid of the stigma how are we are we talking about him like this why are we calling him crazy why are we canceling him why are we not trying to help him you know why are we not trying to understand him and 
And maybe if we can't understand him, at least, like, understand, well, that's Connie's just, he's got his mental health disorders, you know, sometimes he's going to say something that we don't agree with, you know, so we're just going to leave it at that. Why are we taking it to the extreme and, and ostracizing and, and putting a stigma around him like crazy? Like, that seems so counterintuitive to what we have as as a culture been trying to do for the movement surrounding the branch of that movement of mental health. It hurts me. It makes me it makes me very angry as somebody who suffers from mental health and um, I've been I've been battling my own um, uh, manic depression and since I was maybe in ninth grade, 10th grade. Um, you know, I've been very I've had a mother who was very supporting of me and who's, you know, helped me through any type of um, um, and, you know, episode that I've been in, whether it's been manic or depressive or, you know, whether whatever treatment that I've tried to use, whether it was uh, psychological, you know, therapy or whether I, I, I took my own treatment in my own hands of trying to use drugs as a therapy or whether it's been, um, you know, changing my diet and exercising and all these different things. You know, I've done many different things and I've had a, a, a support system through my mother, especially, but around me in terms of my friends and, and mentors that have just embraced me and, and always pushed me to do my best and, and loved me through that. And it's been it's been helpful for me. But there's always been people in my life as well that have that have hurt me and, and brought me down and used terms like crazy and um, and all all types of other things, you know, surrounding me as a as a mental um, head case. And I, so I, it, it, str it strikes me deeply when I see somebody like him in a similar position for me that is just hurt and is just kicked on and has mental health issues and is ignored from that. And it becomes a target because of it rather than is offered help or is told that he needs help or is told that, you know, there is, you know, different ways to heal. Like he's mentioned, you know, getting exercise, getting fresh air as much as he can, you know. Um, his Sunday service is about, you know, healing and and such. So he's mentioned that and nobody gives him credit for trying to tr try healing his, his, his mental illness in a positive way. It's just negativity, negativity, negativity. And it's just stigma, stigma, stigma. You know, it strikes me deep because I've witnessed it in my own life and it hurts and, and it does not help people. I'm at a place where I am, am finally able to understand that and understand that they don't have to do, their opinions don't have to do anything with me and I don't have to hear it. I don't have to, um, you know, react to it. I don't have to give energy to it, even if I do have to hear it. But I understand that, and I'm sure he's at a similar place, but I understand that there's people watching him who suffer just like me and just suffer just like us and they don't understand that that's that's not how you react to somebody and there's people that that suffer and they don't understand that that's how that's how they are and that's not that's not a bad thing they're being shamed for that and i really hope that um I really hope that people can take a second look at how they are addressing the things that he says that you can disagree with somebody and not call them crazy. You can disagree with somebody and not ostracize them. Um, I'm hoping that the idea that Kanye is just crazy is put to rest. They've been saying it since he was on... Um, uh, Sway in the morning, and he was he had a, he had an episode where he was talking about how Sway all this stuff. Da, 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 you can't. You, they tell me to build my own, but it's not happening. Blah blah blah. You can't do that. After that, he ended up building a, a billion dollar empire, you know, in Yeezy. And so, just understand that he's not crazy. He has some insight, you know. Before that, when he was talking about when he snatched the mic from Taylor and said, you know, Beyonce's got one of the best videos of all time, you know. He was right. They were racist. It's that simple. He's now the grand, most Grammy Award winning artist of all time. You know, there's not there's, there's not a coincidence in this universe. So 
I understand coming from the perspective of somebody who gets a, intense and who gets, and I'm sure you can feel it in this episode even, like I get intense, I get emotional, I get passionate, and, and I go on rants myself. And, and, and people don't want to hear me when I do that. People blame me as an aggressor. People blame me as, as crazy and, you know, I, I just can't handle you, you know. I've been told I don't know who I'm going to get with you. You know, which mess fin am I going to get today? You know, I don't, I can't handle you. That's not the language that you need to be using for people that have mental health disorders. And so, and understand that, you know, to at least to a spectrum of a degree, people, most people have some type of spec, you know, mental health disorder, you know, even if it's some really small on the spectrum, they're dealing with something, you know, even if it's just stress as a mental health disorder, you know small levels of anxiety, you know, whatever it is, you know, people are hurting. And I hope that, that after hearing this, and after seeing the life of Kanye West, that we can learn to hear people and and just comfort people, regardless of what their, their opinions are, whether they be good or bad, you know, that we can just say, you know what, you're thinking something that is not positive. But I'm not even going to worry about it. Because I understand that you're hurting yourself. I'm hurting. And so let's heal each other while, with our presence and giving love to each other rather than trying to bring each other down for what we disagree on. Find the bridges, man. And if you can't find them, build them even harder. But you can do it. You're all extremely powerful. Your words are powerful. Your thoughts are powerful. They create your own reality. Your words and your thoughts create your own reality. Your actions as well, of course. What you tell yourself every day is what you end up creating. Changing your thoughts after living years and years and years um, thinking the same things over and over is not easy, but it's possible. And that's your power as a rational being. You can change your thoughts and think whatever you want. That's what I believe is about the free thinking. Don't be a slave to your thoughts. Forcibly change them every day. It's like a workout. At first, it's hard. And it's hard for a long, long, long time. But in a year of working out every day or every day you're supposed to be working out in that time, you end up seeing changes that you didn't even know were possible. Dream big, give energy to only the things that you know you want to give energy to in your heart of hearts, and love each other. Try to hear each other, listen to each other. You don't have to agree with me, you don't have to agree with Kanye West, you don't have to agree with anybody else. Just listen to your heart. Listen to to that thing that tells you what you can do. You know, you truly, not the voice that's saying, you know, oh, bye. That would be hard. That would take this. That would take that. Don't listen to that. Listen to those urges, those impulses that tell you, oh, I crave that. I crave something. What do I crave? Think in your own head. Sit down and, and write even. Or just create an image of what it is that you need and you crave and go after it. That's a message that I learned from Kanye West that I can do anything. Kanye West once said that if you listen to my music, you're not a fan of me, you're a fan of yourself. Because my, my, my music is all about empowering yourself. And so I hope that in, in some reflections, this, um, this podcast, this channel is a continuation of that. If you watch this channel, I hope you're not a fan of me. I hope you're a fan of yourself. And if you're not right now, I hope to get you there someday. It's a great place to end. Thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. Thank you for entertaining me. Um, I really appreciate the support that I've gotten so far. Keep it up, please. This is my dream. I hope to help you pursue your dreams. So help me pursue my dreams. Like, subscribe, comment, all the above. Watch watch the video again, man. Devote another hour to it. Shoot. I really appreciate you all. Thank you for coming. Thank you for viewing. Episode 1, Kanye West, Donald Trump Paradox.
This is it. Love yourself. Bye-bye.